Hey, Restoration Life family, we're so happy you joined us today. Our prayer is that this message speaks directly to your life and has restoration power. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to stay up to date with our upcoming messages. Let's take a listen. Well, it's good to be here this morning. And uh, what an honor it is to be at Restoration Life Church, the, the best church in the South Bay, right? And uh, I'm so honored to have been invited here. Uh, I just want to give a big shout out and big honor to uh, Pastor Eddie and Roxanne Vargas, the pastors of this church. And uh, so honored that they invited me. I know they're away and uh, Pastor Nick and all the staff. I also want to give a shout out to all the staff because of their hospitality. And they've been taking care of my wife and I. So just give a shout out to them. I'm so blessed. Uh, they've taken care of every need even before I got here. And so, again, I'm so honored to be here. If you're here for the first time, you're a visitor, uh, I'm just the guest speaker today. You won't hear me again for a long time. They're the better preacher than me, uh, Pastor Eddie, when he comes next week. So uh, I'm just kind of the preliminary guy, okay? Uh, come next week and you're going to hear an awesome man of God. Uh, but I'm going to give it my best shot this morning. Is that all right? Uh, I am honored also, uh, my wife and I, uh, just a couple weeks ago, uh, we've been married 39 years, and we met in high school, we're high school sweethearts, and I seen her there, I remember in the stairwell, uh, she was dating another guy, we call him Bozo, and Bozo was dating her at the time, and I said, one, one of these days, that girl is going to be mine. And sure enough, uh, she came over to, I was in gymnastics. I know I don't look like I'm a gymnast today. But, but at that time, I was a pommel horse. And guess what? She, she wasn't coming to see me. She was coming to see another bozo at the time. But guess who won? I won today. And so we're married 39 years. And we're so excited. I know next year is going to be 40 years married and also 35 years pastoring our church in the city of Paramount, and uh, we're excited about that. We're excited about what the Lord's doing here. So God bless all of you. Thank you for having us today. Uh, I'm going to minister on something I believe will really help you. And if you're taking notes, I want to encourage you to take notes. If you don't normally take notes, maybe jot some things down in your fo on your phone. But I'm going to talk about faith. I'm going to talk about all in faith. And this, this is the term when we talk about all in, is the term when someone commits everything that's available, all your resources, you put all your efforts toward a goal, really became popular during the uh, TV program, Texas Hold'em. How many of you watched that? Okay, some of you guys are not being honest, but you got to know when to hold them, got to know when to fold them, learn when to walk away, right? Learn when to run, right? So Texas Hold'em became a real popular on TV. And they came, the, the term all in, again, referring to I'm putting all the chips in, everything. I'm risking it all. I'm willing to lose it all, but I'm going to put it all in. I'm going to go all in on this bet. And this same term can be used in various other content, can be used in sports, it could be used in business. It could be used in personal relationships. We're saying, I'm willing to be all in, fully committed to this relationship, fully committed to this business, fully committed to this event. And when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel means good news. Doesn't cost you anything because Jesus paid the price already. But it does demand everything. Doesn't cost you anything because Jesus paid the price, but it does demand everything. It demands that you be all in. I'm not going to read the scripture, but you can write it down in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, and I'm going to pray. Jesus made this statement to love him more than anyone else, even your own life. He said, otherwise, you cannot be my disciple Jesus wants us to be all in today. So I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to help us as we dive into this message. 
So, Father, we thank you today for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the goodness of God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd open our hearts, our minds today. Whatever state of mind people are in right now, wherever they're at in their faith, wherever they're at in their life, I pray that the word of God would speak into their hearts today because your word is not outdated. Your word is not something that is irrelevant. In fact, your word is relevant today in 2023. It applies to our life right now. So I pray for the anointing of your spirit that I declare your truth today in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. Thank you very much. Great piano player over there, right? Awesome. Thank you. Vienna, right? Like Italy, right? Vienna? All right. Awesome. I got a word for you in just a moment. Amen. I'm going to give you a word. I believe God has a word for you today, Vienna. And uh, the Bible said it demands that we go all in. And again, it's a term that all of us need to understand. If we're not, if we're not careful, we can live our life like what they call FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. There are a lot of people that way, they live that way, they're afraid that if they go all in with God, that they're going to miss out in life, and reality is the only thing you're going to miss out on what God has to offer you. If you don't hold out on God, God won't hold out on you. Throughout the Bible, God tells us about faith. Now, a lot of us today would say, well, what is faith? And does faith really make a difference? And so I'm going to kind of define faith to you because there are different aspects of faith today that many times we don't understand. So let me ask you a question today as we're sitting there today. What do you think really pleases God? Because a lot of people think that rituals please God. Certain amount of prayer, certain amount of chants that this pleases God. And it's not the Bible. Many people think that rules and regulations is what pleases God. If, you know, you, you do this, you don't do that. How many know that's Santa Claus? That's not the Bible. Or religion, where if you do a certain amount of things and religious experiences, then you become part of the family of God. It may make you feel good, but that's not the Bible. Really, when it, when it comes to God, he wants a relationship. He doesn't want religion, doesn't want rituals. And unless you're all in, you're not going to experience the true relationship with God. In fact, I will tell you that God requires one thing that pleases him, and that's faith. So let me read a scripture here out of Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So the Bible says to have faith in God is what pleases him. That means you trust God with your life, with your family, with your finances. And all of these things are what pleases God. The Bible says unless you have faith, you cannot please God. Now faith is like a multi-faceted diamond. There is different aspects of faith that I want to talk about today. In fact, I want to talk about six different aspects of faith that will teach you how to please God. And I'm going to take it out of the book of Hebrews chapter 11. If you're looking to find out what faith is in the Bible, you go to Hebrews chapter 11. That is the faith chapter, what we call the hall of faith. And God mentioned people in this chapter, these are people that please God. These are people that actually please God because of their faith. Men and women of God that could teach us how to have faith. Now, what is faith? Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Or let me just read out of the Living Bible, I like what it says. It says, what is faith? It is a confident assurance, not a maybe, not a perhaps, that something we want is going to happen. It is, cer- it is the certainty that what we hope for 
is waiting for us. Even though we cannot see it up ahead, men of God in days of old were what? Famous for their faith. By faith, by believing God, we know that the world and the stars, in fact, all things were made at God's command. And that they were all made from things that cannot be seen. So let me just cover this first point. Write this down. Faith is believing even when we don't see it. Faith is believing even when we don't see it. Basically, faith is visualizing the future in the present. It's seen in advance, being certain of what we do not see. It is the confident assurance that something is going to happen. It is the confidence to see and believe in your heart before you hold it in your hand. There's a story I remember reading about a, a military man and his wife were on a ship. And as the ship was going along, they came upon a violent storm. And it began to rock the boat. And the uh, military man, or this, uh, he was kind of a general, really, he was trying to calm down his wife. And his wife was very frantic about what was going on. And she was really fearful. And she looked at him and said, how could you be so calm when all of this is going on? And at that moment, he took out his sword, and he pointed it at her heart. And he said, are you afraid of this? And she said, of course not. He said, how come? He said, because I know you're holding that sword, and you will never hurt me. And he told her, I know who holds the storm in his hand and who calms all the waters. His name is God. His name is Jesus, and he'll take care of us. Isn't that an awesome story? I begin to think about that story. I'm going to mess it up. Is that all right? I'm going to kind of mess up the story. I realize these people didn't grow up in the hood. Had they grown up in the hood, it would have been a little different. Could you imagine the guy would have said, are you afraid of this? Took out his sword. And today in the hood, this, little, this woman would have reached in her purse, took out a little 22 and said, are you afraid of this? <laughs> all right. I don't know why he said that, but I thought it was interesting. But often... We often say, I'll believe it when I see it. But God's word is saying to believe it, you have to believe it in order to see it. Now, to be honest with you, faith happens all around us, even outside the church, even outside the people of faith. In the secular world, faith is an operation all the time. In fact, if you're an architect, you're planning a building or you're an artist creating a painting, or you're a guy that has an eye on a certain girl like I did, right? And you believe it before you see it, or you, you, you're, you're believing that it's going to happen, or it could be an Olympic athlete. What do they do? They imagine themselves doing it before it actually happens. You're an athlete. You imagine the crowd is shouting before you cross the finish line. If you're an architect, you imagine this picture of this building before it actually is built. Faith is in operation all the time. There's a man by the name of Warner Von Braun. They call him the father of the space age. And he built the Saturn rockets that sent men to the moon. And he made this statement. There has never been any significant achievement in human history that was not accompanied by faith. This scientist, listen to me, this scientist understood that it took a degree of faith outside of knowledge and ingenuity for things to come to pass. And I believe today how much more should the people of God have faith in God that God could do the miracle, he could do the supernatural if we'll just believe him today. Faith can turn dreams into reality. Everything starts with faith, and then you begin to see it come to pass. I was thinking even as a few weeks ago as we were in the REACH conference a few weeks ago and begin to see all of the churches and the network and, and all of that. It's awesome. How many enjoyed the conference? Huh? I mean, it was just tremendous. 
It's always exciting for me to just see everyone gather. Kind of, it's just awesome to see everyone together, worshiping God together. And, but I, I begin, God always kind of reminds me as I'm there in the front watching all this happen. I, I, I remember back, you know, when we, we were just a church, at least where I'm pastoring, we were just a small little church that was struggling. I remember it was us, me and my wife and my son, and, and we were trying to make things happen. We were believing God that one day that this church was going to grow, that we were going to be able to raise up men and women of God, that we were going to be able to send out churches one day and all of that. And it was just a small church, uh, not a lot happening at the time, but it takes a little bit of faith. And today we are the REACH Network. We have churches in Southern California, Colorado, Washington, Texas, Atlanta, hallelujah, all of these different places together. We're doing great things for God. Number two, write this down. All in faith is obeying even when I don't understand it. So God gives us a great example of a man by the name of Noah. And Noah, I believe, must have had a little bit of doubt when God spoke to him and told him, hey, I'm going to start the world over again with your family, and I'm going to flood the whole world. I can imagine Noah was saying, man, did I have a bad burrito the night before? Did I have bad trip? Did I hear this right? That God is going to flood the whole world? Again, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it was by faith that Noah built an ark to save his whole family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about something that had never happened, excuse me, before. He obeyed God even when he didn't understand it, even when it didn't make sense, even when it didn't ever happen before. The Bible says that God was going to flood the earth. And here's what I want you to realize. It, didn't even, it hadn't even rained before. The earth was watered by a mist that came up from the ground. It was kind of some kind of condensation. If you read the word of God, that's how it watered the earth. So here's... Here is God speaking to Moses, uh, not Moses, but Noah, saying, I, Noah, I want you to build this boat because a flood is coming. I can imagine Noah saying, what's the flood? He said, well, it's when it rains. He goes, what's rain? It's like a lake when it pours out water from above. And, and so he said, I want you to build this boat in the middle of nowhere because I'm going to bring the water to you. I can imagine the ridicule and the condemnation and all the critics that begin to come to his house or come to his area where he was. This fool thinks God spoke to him. This fool believes that there's going to be a flood. And he began to build this ark. And yet Jesus makes reference of the story for those of you that don't believe in the flood. Luke 17 said, and it was in the days, as it was in the days of Noah... So it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. We know that the ark is a metaphor of Jesus. Jesus is the ark. He says, come on aboard, I'll save you and rescue you. So Noah obeyed God and here's what I want you to think about. You don't have to understand completely in order to obey immediately. See, many times we think, well, i got to understand everything before I obey. No, Noah didn't understand everything. There were no guarantees. He just believed God. Many times we want God to guarantee everything before we do anything. That's not faith. 1989, my wife and I were sent out. To start a church in a city. We didn't know what city it was at the time. We were sent. We didn't leave. We were sent out. And we were sent out by our pastor. He said, you guys are ready to go. And so I want you to go look for a city. And I remember that we drove along the coast of Orange County. Went through Long Beach. Then we drove right through the city of Paramount. And I remember as we came through there. We looked at each other and said, this is it, huh? And she said, yeah. 
we knew this was where God wanted us to be. Now, there was a lot of doubts in our lives at that time. Number one, we were 24 years old. Number two, I'd never been a senior pastor. I'd only been a youth director at the time. Number three, I didn't know a single person in the city of Paramount. And number four, I was scared to death. But I did have some faith. And thank God, because of our yes, there's a church there today. Someone has to obey God. Even when you don't understand it, you have to obey immediately. Can I tell you that this church right here was not founded on some grand plan or some grand scheme. But I can tell you it took someone or a group of people to believe God and have faith. And today this church is here because someone said yes to God. I said someone said yes to God. See, every time, every time God tells you to do something, it's a test. Am I going to trust my gut or am I going to trust God? Am I going to trust what God tells me or am I going to trust what I tell myself? Do you realize, think about this, there are 1,050 commands in the word of God. And some of them, be honest with you, they're unusual, they're inconvenient. They almost seem impossible, and yet they're for our benefit. Did you know that God's commands are for our benefit? That God loves you and that God cares about you. He wants the best for you. This is why it takes faith and trust to do what he tells you to do. Excuse me. We all got to open this bottle here. Hold on a second. Sorry, guys, I got a bit of a cough. <clears throat> so I'm not going to, I'm trying not to push myself, but I'm a preacher, and I just keep trying to go further than I want. So bear with me. Is that all right? <clears throat> <clears throat> How many remember when you were a kid and your parents would tell you things that just didn't make sense to you? Now you go, man, what is wrong with these old fogies? They don't know what's going on. And they would ask you to do things, and you would say, that doesn't make sense. Give me a good reason. Why do I have to do this? And they would tell you, you know, you have to make up your bed every day. Why do I have to make it up? I'm just going to mess it up anyway. You got to clean your room. Why do I have to clean my room? Nobody comes in here. It's just me. I'm okay with it. Right? You got to go to school. You got to do your chores. You got to do all this stuff. And at the moment, you're saying, this doesn't make any sense to me. And you didn't realize because of your immaturity and the season you were in in your life, you didn't realize what your, your parents were trying to teach you. They're trying to teach you discipline, trying to bring order in your life, trying to prepare you for your future. And they knew what was best for you, but because of your immaturity, you didn't understand what they were telling you. And then the worst answer, I, I mean, it used to get under my skin. Because, you know, sometimes we would just debate our, our parents. Like, but why? How come? What this is? What, what about this? And the whole thing. And, you'd be the, and, then, and then they would get kind of tired and tell you, because I said so, that's why. Because I'm your dad, you need to obey what I'm telling you. Because I'm your mom, and I said so. Because I'm your dad, and I said so. Wouldn't I just get under your skin like, oh, can't believe they just said, that it? Yeah, that's it, period. Listen to what I told you. You better do it. And we would think that that sounded unreasonable, that that didn't make any sense, that we would often, often think, you know, they're being sarcastic. This is this like this off, you know, off the cusp remark. But we didn't realize that our parents were telling us, I'm in charge and I know you don't understand what's going on in this season in your life. You don't understand what I'm trying to do, but I'm doing it for your good. And it's going to help you later on in the future, but you don't understand that right now. It may not make sense to you right now. It may not sound like a good reason right now, but later on you're going to learn. That's when we learn that we don't operate out of reason, but out of revelation. When you get a revelation of who your parents are and what they're trying to do for you, it changes everything. 
This is the same way when we serve God out of revelation and not out of reason, it will change your whole perspective of God. That when God demands something on you, when God asks something from you, you're not operating out of reason, but you're operating out of revelation. You begin to realize that just as your parents were wiser than you, they knew better than you, God is wiser than you. He knows better for you. When he asks you to do something, do it, operate out of revelation, not out of reason. Oh, man, I'm preaching better than you're clapping, but that's okay. See, sometimes we do that with our pastors. Our pastor will ask us to do things. He will instruct us in a certain way, and we don't think that's a good enough reason. But if you get a revelation of who your pastor is, that he loves you and cares about you, that he has this experience, that he's trying to warn you, not control you, that he's trying to guide you, not harm you, that he's seen these patterns before and he's trying to get you to avoid them because what you don't learn from instruction, you will learn from experience. See, some people today, you want to learn from experience. Go ahead, fool. I'm not going there. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have six brothers. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, there's seven of us all together. And I'm number six and I have a younger brother. And I watch my five brothers make all these mistakes, and I realize, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm certainly not doing that. Or he's got his girlfriend pregnant. I'm not doing that. He did this. He did that. I go, I'm not, because I, I begin to learn from instruction, okay, instead of experience. They were trying to teach me something. My parents, others were trying to teach me, say, you can go down that path. And this is the price that you'll pay, or you can learn by what I'm telling you, and you don't have to pay the price. If you get a revelation rather than a reason, changes everything about your aspect with God. Number three, are you ready for this? I got to go quickly. Faith, faith is giving when I don't have it. Giving is faith, and faith go together. Listen to me, people that don't give and you're not generous, here's what I want to tell you. God uses finances to test our faith. In fact, it's in the Bible. Have you ever been to a place where should I give to God or should I pay my bills first? Should I give to God first or pay my bills first? This is a test of your faith. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Bring to the storehouse a full tenth of what you earn so there will be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, all-powerful I will open the windows of heaven for you and pour out all the blessings that you need. So God is saying, are you going to trust me? Are you going to trust my promises and put me first? Or are you going to trust yourself? See, God will trust you with what you have to see if you can trust you with what he has. So in Scripture... God gives us an example of a man that gave by faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, in fact, the very first man that is mentioned, it says, it was by faith or it was faith that made Abel's offering to God a better sacrifice than Cain. Through his faith, God approved of his giving. Now, here's what I want you to understand about Abel. Abel is put in the hall of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, along with all of these other folks that did great, wondrous things, uh, God used them to do supernatural miracles, uh, miraculous things happen. And yet when you think of Abel, there is nothing miraculous about him. There is no great achievement. But the Bible puts him first to say that he gave to God in faith. He gave to God better than his brother Cain. Cain gave whatever he wanted. Cain said, I'm just going to give you whatever. God, Abel gave what God required. It was a sacrifice for Abel to kill a sheep and give it to God. But he gave it to God. He gave in faith. There was an attitude in which he gave. You know how Abel gave? He gave by revelation, not by reason. A lot of us, when it comes to giving, we're giving by reason and not by revelation. 
We're, well, you know, here's our reason. Well, you know, can I afford to give? Do I have enough money? You're giving by reason. Atheists give by reason. They give to different causes. Uh, they give by reason. But people of God give by revelation. When you give by reason, you look at your bank account and you say, well, let's see if I can afford to give and do that. When you give by revelation, they said, I can afford not to give. You give by revelation. I'm going to give because I know what Jesus did for me. And this little that I'm giving back is nothing compared to how much God's the giver. I need to be a giver. God is generous. I need to be generous. When my wife and I first got married, I was a, we weren't making very much money. I'll be honest with you. Uh, back, we got married in 1984, July 28th, the day the Los Angeles Olympics opened. Kind of an Olympic wedding. It was just awesome. Uh, and it was the day the Los Angeles Olympics, 1984, we got married. And I remember that I was making or bringing home a check every week for $108. Now you may say, well, that must have been a lot of money in 1984. It was nothing. My friends were making quadruple that. But we got married in faith. We knew that God wanted us to get married. I knew it was the will of God. She did. She worked. Uh, part-time as the teacher's aide, she was bringing in some money, and then I was bringing in. But one of the things that we decided long before we even got married is that we would always give to God first. We would always tithe of every, whatever we made, we're going to give it to God. Our first check was always our tithe check. Before we paid bill, before we paid rent, we always gave our tithe check. Back then you had the little register. How many know what I'm talking about? Checkbook with a register. Some of you young people don't even know what I'm talking about. But you had a register and you deducted and all of that. And you went, you wrote all your checks in there, whatever you, whatever you did. And I remember our first check, though, we always gave to God first. And can I tell you that God always met our need on the minimum that we had because we put God first. And God began to bless us from there. Now, many of you are saying, I can't tithe, that's a lot. Didn't God save your soul a lot? Didn't he bless you a lot? Didn't he change your life a lot? Hasn't God done a lot in your life? And when we think about giving and, and supporting the kingdom of God, we give because God today has given more to us. We're saying we can never outgive God. How many can say amen to that? In fact, I've talked to some very successful, wealthy people and I've talked to them before, business people, and they've told me this. They said the best time for us to give is when our business is in the dumps. I go, why is that? Because we know that if we'll trust God right now, if we give to God then, God will bless us later. That's amazing when you think about it. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8, 3, because of their great joy, they gave more than they could afford. Number four, are you ready for this? Faith is persisting even when I don't feel like it. Our culture does everything based on feelings. If it feels good, do it. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Let me just tell you, immature people operate out of feelings. Mature people operate out of commitment. We live by our commitments, not by our emotions and our feelings. How many realize that feelings come and go? But when you make a commitment, you stick to those commitments. You keep doing what is right. There's times in my life where I don't always feel like being nice to everyone. Anybody ever been there? I don't always feel like, you know, helping. Sometimes I feel selfish. One man said, sometimes I wake up grumpy. But other times I let her sleep in. Some of you got it. Anyway, there are times today that I don't feel like helping out. I don't feel like doing this. Uh, can, I, can I shock some of you? There are times that I don't even feel like reading the Bible, and I'm a pastor. Yeah, don't look shocked. I'll take even to another. There are times I don't even feel like praying. There are times that I don't feel like serving. There are times that, you know, I don't feel like doing certain things uh, and I can tell you today that even in the secular world, 
What separates the successful people and ordinary people is the people who are persistent are the ones that reach their goal. You can talk to people or you can read about people like Olympic athletes uh, and you watch them as they compete and they win uh, medals and, and you, can, you can look at these people and say, man, they're great athletes. But can I tell you, if you ask them, man, do you feel like getting up every morning and working out? Are you always in that mood? Or if these great master musicians, do you feel like practicing over and over again? No. But they do it because they're persistent. There are times in my life where I don't always feel like doing things, but I do it because I'm persistent. There are times where I'm not in the mood to do things. There have been moments, can I tell you, that, that even, uh, you know, I don't feel like going to church. Can I just be vulnerable today? And I have to tell my mood, you know what, feeling just kind of get over there in the corner there. I'm going to take a shower right now. I'm going to brush my teeth. I'm going to shave. And you just sit right over there. I get in my car. I drive to the church. Thank God as I'm there at the church and I'm worshiping God and, and I'm lifting up my hand. Guess who comes walking through the door? Feeling does. Feeling shows. I don't know if it hitchhiked how it got there. But me and feelings start connecting now, and now we're feeling good because the presence of God, because I lead my feelings, feeling doesn't lead me. And you got to begin to operate in persistent faith. Moses, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27, said it was by faith that Moses left Egypt, was not afraid of the king's anger. He's talking about Pharaoh, but he held to his purpose like a man who could see the invisible. He was persistent. You may be out there saying, man, I don't feel like serving God. I don't feel like keeping my marriage. I don't feel like completing. Stay persistent. Don't give up. Don't quit. And number five, I'm going to move real quick. Faith is thanking God before I receive it. Thanking God in advance. Hebrews 11.30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after the people had marched around them for seven days. In other words, they had to thank God before the walls came down. And the Bible says they marched around seven times. But on the seventh day, they marched seven times. They blew the horn. They began to shout in advance, thanking God. And the walls came tumbling down. Faith is believing in advance, saying, God, we're thanking you in advance. And we're thanking you right now. How many today, if I gave you a gift card, if I gave you a gift card today, and you just, you took it, but you didn't thank me, I said, well, why didn't you thank me? Well, because I'm not sure there's any money on the gift card. I got to go cash it first. Right? See, this is thanking God in advance, that God is true to his word, and we're not going to go wait and I have a gift card right now. Anybody want this gift card? I think there's $25 on this gift card for Starbucks. Anybody want this card? Well, if you want it, come and get it. There it is. What do you say? You're welcome. You're not, you're not going to thank me afterwards. You thank me in advance, right? Same way in the kingdom of God. We're thanking God in advance. That God is true to his word. We're saying, God, we thank you before we've even cashed it in. And number six, this is the last thing here, and I'm going to close in just a moment, but I think it's very important, and I want to help you with this because some of you really need to hear this part. If some of you checked out earlier, that's okay. You took a nap, but here, if you would just listen to this last part. Faith is trusting God even if I don't get it. Faith is trusting God even if I don't get it. Some need some help in this because I've been talking about faith. I've been asked, telling you that God answers and will believe God. But there are moments in life that you have to have faith even when you don't have it or you don't get it. So here's the thing about God is we think that anything we ask, God's going to give it to us. Like God is some kind of vending machine. How many know that everything in the vending machine is good for you? 
And just because you're asking God to say, well, God, you know, I asked for it. You should just give it. Not everything in that vending machine is good for you. You got diabetes. You probably shouldn't be pushing the vending machine. Am I right? Just saying. It'd be like your 10-year-old came up to you, your mom or dad, and said, hey, dad, you know, he's 10 years old. Can I get the car keys? What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm going to just drive the car. I'm going to go pick up my friends. And, and you say, hold on a second. Well, you're my dad. You have a car. You have a key. I'm asking you. You should give them to me. But you're saying, wait a minute. You're not ready for that, son. You don't even know how to drive yet. You're not mature. In fact, if I gave you the car keys, you might hurt yourself or someone else. I can't give you what you want right now. Just because you ask for it doesn't mean you get it. And there are a lot of things in life today that we think, man, if I just ask for God's going to get it. See, I believe this sometimes. God will meet our need, but not necessarily our greed. And there are some things in life today that God's not automatically going to give you. In fact, here's what I want to say to you, and I want to qualify what I'm saying. God hears and answers every prayer that you pray. But he doesn't always answer in the way you want him to answer. I want to qualify what I'm saying. I don't want to rock your faith. I've been talking about faith, but I want to give you the right aspect of what I'm saying. Sometimes, listen to me, God's going to say yes to that need. Other times, like I explained, God's going to say no. You don't need that right now. Other times, God's going to say not yet. You're not ready. And number four, I love this one. God says, I got a better idea. I love that. Like, God, you got a better idea? I'll wait then. Hallelujah. Got a better one for me? Some of you right now, you've been asking for stuff, and God says, I got something better for you. You're all mad. You're all upset. God says, I got something better. Why are you complaining? Just wait. I'll give it to you. It's coming. Trust me. See, there are a couple things today that are going to build up our faith that times we don't even realize. You know, I was thinking about this, and did I say I was going to close? Give me two more minutes, okay, and I'll close. I was thinking about this the other day, and uh, a number of years ago, I heard this interview of this pastor who was in China, and he talked about the persecution that was going on in China and how the church was being persecuted and all of these different things that were happening. And uh, the radio guys, the radio host said, hey, well, we're going to pray that God stop the persecution. And this guy goes, says, oh, no, 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 don't stop. Don't, we're not praying that. He goes, why not? He goes, it's because of the persecution that there's a revival going on. We want to pray for strength in the persecution. We want to pray for faith in the persecution, but not that the persecution would stop. Now, most of us would never pray that. But he's giving us a different aspect couple of things that are going to build your faith, and I'm going to close. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You've got to hear the word of God. That's why coming to church, reading your Bible is powerful. Number two, what builds our faith is our trials and battles. None of us like this, but I'm going to read it to you. 1 Peter 1, 7, these trials are only to test your faith, and your faith is far more precious than gold. Or Precious to God than, more, than mere gold. It will bring you much praise and honor on the day of his return. A faith that has not been tested cannot be trusted. You are going to go through some things in life, but if you'll trust God, it will build you. It will make you. And I'll just say this. There have been a lot of people that have asked me, Pastor, if you can go back and change some things in your life, what would you change? And I, uh, immediately I go back to the battles and trials, the sufferings. I go, man, I would go back and I said, wait a minute, hold on a second. If I change that, then, then I don't learn this. Then I don't build on this. Then it, uh, some of those battles changed me. Some of those trials changed my perspective. Some of those trials were my greatest growth. You know what? I tell people I wouldn't change anything. 
because I'm trusting God today that he cares about my life and he cares about you. How many would say amen today? I want to pray for you. Why don't we just bow our heads, close our eyes. Father, in the name of Jesus, across this building, there are so many that are here. God, we want to trust you today that you're, you're good, that you're awesome, God, that there's nobody like you, that God, we can trust you that you're a God that we can put our faith in today, that you care more about us than we even realize. So, Father, help us to have faith in you. Help us to trust you today, God. Help us not to debate you and argue. Help us to get revelation and serve you out of revelation, not out of reason. So, Father, reach across this building right now. If you're in this place right now, though, and you're a visitor or maybe you've been here before, but you've never put your faith in Jesus. You've never trusted God with your life today. Maybe there's been lots of reasons for that. But you've never trusted God. You've never put your faith in the Lord today. And you say, you know what, Pastor, I need God in my life. I want to put my faith in God. I put my faith in a lot of things. Maybe you put your faith in people. Maybe you put your faith in your money. You put your faith in things in life. And you realize they let you down. Can I tell you, Jesus will never let you down. Put your faith in God right now. With every head bowed, every eye closed, you said, man, I need God in my life. I want to put my faith in the Lord today. Would you raise your hand right now and say, Pastor, I need God in my life. Would you pray for me? Right over here, a number of people. God bless you. Right down here, there's people right here. Thank you. Several people. Oh, thank you for raising your hand. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Did I, did I miss anyone? God bless you over here. Thank you. Anybody else? You say, I want to put my faith in God today. I want to put my faith in God today. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's happened in your life, but God does, and he loves you. Thank you back there. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you right down here. He said, I want to put my faith in God today. I need God in my life today. I need to do that. Thank you. Thank you right over here. God bless you. Several people say, I want to put my faith in in the Lord today. I, today I'm going to do that. Those that raise your hand, would you just look up at me real quick? You guys all mean that? You mean that? You mean that over here? Amen. Why don't we all stand together, everybody in the room? If you raise your hand and say, I want to put my faith in God today. I need him in my life right now. Would you get out of your seat and come down here? We just want to pray for you right now. I know it's hard. Take a step of faith. Take another step of faith. And say, man, I, I'm going to come up for prayer. I'm going to ask Jesus, this young man down here, God bless you. God bless you, bro. How you doing, man? How you doing? God bless you. Stand right here with me. Just come face me. we got a family coming. Is there anyone else? I'm not here to embarrass you. Can you kind of make your way down here? There you go. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. God bless you. God bless you, man. God bless you guys. Hi. Hi. God bless you. How you doing? God bless you over here. God bless you. This young lady here, God bless you. Who else? Who else? You, you just say, man, I need the Lord in my life. Come, come. This young lady here, God bless you. God bless you. How you doing? How you doing? God bless you. Hi, right, God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? How you doing over there? God bless you. We're going to pray right now. And I don't know who you are, but God does. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I want you to say this prayer, not to me or anyone next to you. I want you to say it to God. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's the attitude of your heart. And I'll give you the words, but you need to mean it from your heart today. And ask Jesus to come into your life, okay? Why don't we all bow our heads and close our eyes? I'll give you the words. Say this prayer with me and say it to God. Say this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me and you rose again. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of all my sin. Be Lord of my life. Change my life. From this day forward, I will serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray for them right now. Father, we pray the Holy Spirit would reach across this building right now with every single person that came forward today, 
God, you would come into their lives. You would come into their hearts today. Father, by faith, they've asked you today to be Lord of their lives. I pray, let your presence, let your grace reach across this building right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, pray for them right now. Pray for them right now. Man, if, if you're out there right now, and you're saying, you know what? I, I need a little bit more faith. I need God to enlarge my faith. I need to trust God even when I don't see it. I need to obey God even when I don't understand it. I need to give to God even when I don't have it. I need right now to thank God in advance. I need right now, even if I don't receive it, I need to thank I need to have faith in God. How many would say, I need that right now? Would you, would you make your way down here? We're going to pray for you. Come on, you don't, you don't usually come. Come to this altar right now. And I'm going to just take a moment to pray for you. If you say, I need to enlarge my faith a little bit. I need to put my trust in God. Maybe you're going through something in your life. Just come right now. I need God to help me in my faith. I need God to help me. Just come. Come right now. If you need that, this young man, whoever you want to come right now, we're going to pray. We're going to believe God. Would you just stretch out your hands right now? Let's begin to believe God right now all over this building. Holy Spirit. Come on, you can lead us in worship. We're just going to pray. If you want to come down for any reason, we're going to believe God right now.
decision to walk out of here with new faith or you can walk out of here with the same faith that you walked in with. But it's up to you. It's up to you. And he's encouraged you and equipped you with the right amount of faith and the tools and the resources to be stronger, but you can only do it through him. And here at Restoration Life, we wouldn't have it that you would do it alone, but we have resources to get you connected here. And so behind me are gonna be a few ways that you guys can get connected. These are your next steps. If, you, if you've taken the step to give your life to Christ today, if you're taking that step of faith to dive in, this is how you get plugged in. Build yourself in here. Put yourself in areas where you're surrounded in community. That's how you grow. So also after service, don't forget to visit our VIP team. They wanna welcome you and give you a brand new gift. We thank you guys so much for being here. Let's close us out in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for showing up today, Lord God. We thank you for your presence being here in this place, Lord God, that you gave us a new hope, a new faith, Lord God. And so we just praise your name for what you're gonna do. We praise your name for who you are in our life. And we say yes to what you have for us. We say yes to faith. We say yes to that new opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys. We love you. Have an amazing week.